Good morning and welcome to Sunday Story Hour, where we share real life stories of how human design has helped our guests know themselves on a deep transformative level. By knowing and trusting ourselves, we develop deeper, more honest relationships and unlock our true gifts. I'm Kathy Bashanko, and my guest this week is Christy Hoffa Sullivan. She is a 4-6 pure sacral generator, and she's going to tell us all about her story and her journey with human design. And I have actually not had the pleasure of meeting Christy in person, and we kind of connected through getting her on for this because she's done a bunch of cool things that she's going to tell you about, and I'm excited to learn a lot of this along with you. So hi, Christy. How are you? Hi, I'm great. And, you know, I wondered if we had crossed paths at a human design conference last year, but maybe not. Um, Well, you know what? We did. Yeah, I think we were at the same thing, but we didn't actually have any real interaction. So you were at the you were at last year's. That's right. Okay, sorry, my bad. No, it's good to be here (laughs) so much. And I look forward to seeing you again in person. Right. Okay. so tell us about your um, a little bit about how you came to finding human design. And then also, I love the self-care aspect you've really brought into this and made your own. So I'd love to know how that all kind of came about for you. Yeah. Well, the story sort of goes back. I discovered human design about seven years ago. And coincidentally, if or not coincidentally, you should probably divine timing was um, right. I was going through a, a couple of big things in my life, starting with um, my father who had Alzheimer's and um, I was trying to build a business on the side. Uh, things were bumpy in my marriage and there was just like an opportune time for me to learn more about myself and start to peel back that that onion, I call it, um, that human design helps you to understand so that I could help with more healing to myself and, uh, understanding with awareness, some of the things that I, that I was doing or that were happening in my life. I think human design helped me during a time when I really needed to kind of look inward. And that's also the self-care piece that comes in because when I discovered human design, it was like a light bulb. I thought, wow, this is amazing. I, I understood pieces of it that really made sense. It's so complex, but the initial things were really easy to understand for me and made sense. And I also knew based on what I was going through that that inner work, especially the self-care for yourself to help you with your stress, with um again, healing any limiting beliefs or past traumas, those all really were things that I needed to be focusing on that I felt the self-care not only helped me get through some of those challenging times, but the human design as a tool also helped me to do the right kind of self-care that I needed. Hmm. Okay. So now you've piqued my interest. How did human design help you with the self-care? Well, I, I realized, you know, there's, there's not one formula that fits for everybody and human design really, uh, I always love personality assessments, but those were sort of boxes and labels and human design, your unique chart is really for you. There's 3 billion combinations. So it really, I knew that what I chose to do for self-care, um, really was for whatever felt good for me, whatever felt like it helped me. And it may not be the same for the the next person or um, people often will say, well, what, what does my chart show? And it's not that your chart shows you exactly what kind of self-care you need, but to understand that in human design, it's about how your energy flows and alignment and living in your design is really about allowing that energy to express and flow with more ease and grace. And, and if you're doing self-care because you think you have to get up at 6 a.m. in the morning and meditate every day and it's hard, it may not be the right kind of self-care tactic for you or um, activity. And really, right. I just learned to tune into to what lit me up, what really felt good for me. Yeah, because you're pure sacral. So you've got that and you have the defined spleen. So both of those tell you in the moment what's good and what's not good, right? 
Yeah. In the moment. And I had to learn to listen to myself. That's definitely part of the journey. And when I discovered human design and learning to really lean into, you know, what did I want to do for self-care, for example, or how did I want to respond to opportunities? Um, and did, was I listening to the sacral or was I using the mind? So that, that definitely was a component that came up. Right. Yeah. Cause you, um, for anybody who I'd put a link in the in the show, the post here to your chart. So if anybody has looked at it, you'll, they'll see you have a completely open head and Ajna. So that's a really beautiful thing, but I could see where you could have been really, you know, stuck in there, right? Because it's what's me, what's not right kind of energy. Yeah. Yeah. And especially to that end, like the self-care that really got me more into my body, like I, especially during 2020, when, you know, many things were closed, I really wanted to go out every day to be in nature, to walk. And that helped ground me. That helped get me into my body um, less in my head. And that I I really learned to appreciate. Um, and I still do. I still really enjoy not just being outside, but doing physical activity and getting into my body. Yeah, that's great. So I'm sorry, did I miss, did you say who, who or how you actually found human design? Who introduced it to you? I um, learned it from a a friend of mine who's a coach. Um, She's um, actually taken a break from coaching, but um, she introduced me to not only human design, but Karen Curry Parker, and we share that teacher. And she um, did a group session for us. And I did an individual reading with someone named Karen Flaherty. Um, who you may know. And so we kind of our group in this coaching program learned about the basis of human design. And from there, it really resonated for me because I had been teaching yoga. So I understood the chakra system and really enjoyed like that idea of how our energy operates. So yeah, a friend of mine who, who doesn't full-time coach uh, human design, she introduced me to it. Okay. And so your initial response, your sacral was like, yeah, this is for me. Right. So you, you had no hesitations in the beginning. It was really um, fascinating to me because the way it was introduced was like, we're all learning to be in this formula and do things a certain way we're programmed and it's not working for all of us easily. It doesn't all lead to success. If we are, my saying was, why aren't we all happy, healthy, and wealthy? If we we're all following, you know, the just do it formula. And so that's what really resonated for me because at the time I was also trying to build a network marketing business and following formulas And just recognize that maybe I needed to do something in my own way. And so it it was an aha for me. And it took me a while, though, I think, to really fully more integrate using human design on a daily basis. I certainly wasn't because I was still in a nine to five job. I was still um, dealing with a lot of conditioning and programming. And like you said, open head and Ajna. So it took me the quite a few years, I think, to really learn more about myself and to start using like more of the authority, more of, is this conditioning that I'm, and that I'm using, or is it more of my intuition and sacral? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that was um, right around your Uranus opposition then, right? Because that was, you said seven years ago and you're 50. You just, in fact, you just Ah, your 50th birthday. What a week, just over a week ago. Happy birthday. Thank you. And I just think it's so funny. I keep talking to all these cross of tensions. My daughter's a cross of tension and, you know, Evelyn Levinson's a cross of tension. And there were like Shannon Kinney do who I interviewed was a cross of tension. And I just, and I think, um, I, I, I think maybe, I don't know. There've been a lot of them that I've talked to you. You see like the world wants me talking to, wants me to feel that, that movement, that tension for expansion, right? So um, all these October birthdays and what the the other ones are, what April and isn't there, are there three versions of cross of tension? Yeah, I believe that there are three. Yeah. Yeah. But those four gates, you know, they come up for me a lot. So, um, or actually there might be four because the incarnation crosses can, those, those gates can switch. So there's 
the, the 88 degrees of the sun, whatever that was. So three months. So basically every three months, right? Yeah. Each cross comes up. So and this is an area and, you probably know more than I do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. My, that's my open head not, or open Ajna undefined head. I have one gate, the gate 64, the gate of confusion. So I'm always looking for to not be confused. Right. Um, so, okay. So you found this system, this knowledge base and um during your uranus opposition so that was a chaotic time i mean for those of you who aren't aware around 43 is one of our significant astrological events called our uranus opposition where the the um lessons in our life really switch from the lessons we came in with these lessons of the south node our lessons we kind of know a little bit and we're bringing in, but we're cementing in that knowledge. Um, and then it switches around our Uranus opposition. Some people start to feel it even before that. Some people are slow learners and it comes after, but generally around that time is when you really start to move from the lessons of your South node to the lessons of your um, North node. And so I'm trying to see here. And for some reason, the way I have my, here we go. Okay, so yours, you went from south node in gate 15 to north node in, oh, so from about um, timing and going into self-love, but all of that is stuff your nodes, I mean, your, your nodes are both on your G-center, so that's really a big identity shift for you, so I could see where that would be um, yeah. something, and then the other ones are, I should have made your chart bigger here. 52 and 58, right? Is that what, am I reading that right? So yeah, 58 and 52 are both on the root center. So pressure, right? We, root center is pressure. So pressure to know yourself, right? In yeah, and mix in that cross of tension, right? Um, right? <laughs> I, um, I definitely felt um, that it wasn't so much, I was putting pressure, but it was like the universe was putting pressure on me, right? Right to yeah turn more inward and to experience things that really had me um start to turn into inward to what are the tools that i have or that i need to work through this and by the way in 2020 i had a career shift so that was another identity shift for sure because i went from that 9 to 5 job to being an entrepreneur full time and um I had been wanting that that was like leading up to things. And it certainly shifted in, in that year for sure as the kind of third, you know, after parents and marriage, then work, those shifts definitely all in identity made a difference. Yeah. So you did a lot of identity shifting. Right. And now here you are in your Chiron return, right? Yes. Um, yeah. And, and so, I, I would say I've been feeling that probably in the last few years. Um, yeah. And I'm also a six line. So in that role model coming off the roof, that also is something that I think I've been feeling. Yeah. Leaning. Can you explain that a little bit for, you know, cause we have a lot of people in the group who are brand new to human design. And if, they, especially if they're not a six line, they might not know what that means. Yeah. I'm a six too. So, you know, I've talked about it a bit, but for those who don't know, just a general yeah, so generally a six line is the profile of the role model. And um, there is a journey there that six lines take. And the first is, uh, it's three phases. The first phase is between birth and about age 29, 30 um, to your Saturn um, return. And that's when that first phase, you're really going through life experimenting and um, trying things out, trial and error. They call it operating like a three profile which is um, the experimenter or martyr. So when you're uh, then in the second phase between 30 and about 50, that is when you, they call it going on the roof. When you kind of sit back from all this experimenting and observe, see how others are experimenting. And I, I was, remember that, that time in my life of really like, I was, I was like learning little bits and things, but always just enough. And then kind of seeing how it worked with other people. I always think of that as the part in, for those of you who are old enough to remember the show Third Rock from the Sun, 
um, yeah. they were aliens living on this planet. And at the end of every episode, they would always be sitting on the roof. They'd crawl out the window and they'd sit up on the roof and they'd look at home where they're from, you know, and they would look out at people and they just kind of talk about life and reflect. And so I always have this visual image of, you know, the, you know, the, the alien people with, you know, the, from third rock from the sun. <laughs> Oh yeah. That's a great, that's a great visual. So we're on the roof, they call it. And up until age 50, and that's when we come off the roof and we fully now are a role model because we've gone through experimenting, we've gone through observing. Um, and we, not everyone may be there at age 50, especially if they haven't done some of that inner work, um, and journey, and you don't have to know human design necessarily to do that. But when I learned human design and learned that, I thought, okay, well, 50 still seems so far away. Um, and I didn't know what it meant to really feel like the role model. But in these last couple of years, knowing human design, teaching it, um, there are a lot of people who come to me and be like, can you, you know, explain my chart? I do readings and, uh, or, you know, I need some advice and I am also four line. So I have a lot of resources and network of people to, to refer. Um, so I see that that role model is, is starting to really be that position I'm in. And it's more important if you're a role model to be rather than to do. So that being is really what I'm practicing. Yeah, Right. Um, so, and the coming off the roof is, oh, I think hopefully a lot easier for those of you who have found human design or some other way of really learning that self-trust and that knowing while you're on the roof to, um, because a lot of the part on the roof is about rest and restoration, right? It's restoring yourself from all, we learned so many things in that first trial and error phase of trying a bunch of different stuff. And we learned so much from what didn't really work, but was necessary for us in our journey. And then we observe other people. And for me, I really noticed that I observed other people who didn't have some of those hard lessons in life and how they didn't necessarily get the perspective that it brings. So it, I was able to then be grateful for some of the things that I used to, you know, curse the day it happened or, you know, really regret these choices I'd made, but I was able to see that, but I didn't find human design until I was already off the roof a couple of years. Cause I'm 10 years older than you. And so I found it, I was off the roof and I realized I was in so much pain because I came off the roof and it's all about being, and I didn't know who I was. And that was a really huge thing to have to at 50 something, you know, cause it took a couple of years before the pain really got loud enough for me to know that I needed to do something. So human design really helped me to realize um, where the conditioning was in me that was telling me I was somebody that I wasn't. And I'm wondering um, if you found finding this on the roof you know, were you able to see those parts more easily? Was it a painful deconditioning process for you? Did you? Mm, I think about that? I think that's a good question. I always say, I think human design finds you at the right time. Mm -hmm. And so I think when I found human design, I had been through some deconditioning that I didn't realize and, or was still in the process of it but I didn't realize maybe that what that's what it was. And the way that you put it was really interesting and, and beautiful because, and it led me to think that we, we all think it's a certain, you know, age and a point, um, especially, you know, the planet like hits our, you know, return at a certain time, but I really yeah, also think that it, it's in divine timing too. Right. So it really is about, um, just knowing it's working out in the way it should work out and like finding when human design, you find it or it finds you it's in divine timing. So I can look back probably as you just put it and say, oh yeah, maybe there was some deconditioning already happening that I didn't realize. Um, and there were also, because when I found human design, I still had some challenges I was going through that was, that was happening. I just didn't know it was a deconditioning process. Yeah. 
So one of the things that I find really interesting and in when I, as I look at my chart always, and then I look at other people is I notice how, how many people have consistent patterns for me. Like, you know, like I mentioned about so many people have this cross of tension that I'm exp- or in my life, or I'm even just exposed to it. And I notice it. And it's like the universe is putting these people here. Cross of tension is <clears throat> the four gates of it are really meant to push people to go deeper, right? And one of the gates that is in it also is gate 21 on the will center, which is about managing resources. And resources are not just money and food, they're energy, time, love, all these things are our resources. And one of the things I've noticed as well that you have that is very common in my life is I have so many people, well, 70% of the planet has an undefined will center. So that's not uncommon, but an undefined will center with a hanging gate 21. And in most cases, only a 21 and maybe one other gate. But so clearly, and I have the gate 21, I have all the gates defined on my will center, but that is like a companionship energy, just the hanging gate um, and this amplification of will that I'm trying to understand um, where that comes from. And I don't know if I'm getting too deep into the weeds here, but that's the way my, my mind works, right? Is I'm like, why does this keep showing up? Is this, um, is this meant to help me to trust? Because it's not, it's not a, um, compromise. A compromise would mean you'd have the whole channel and I just have that one gate. It's not even, and just that not even people having the defined, which that happens a lot too, but it's this amplification of my own sense of resources in a way that feels really interesting. And I just didn't know if you ever look at that kind of weird stuff, or is that just a geeky thing I do? (laughs) Well, first, yes, I I tend to attract a lot of projectors and here you are as a projector. And there's, um, as I was listening to some bonus content from the conference this year, I was um, leaning into this idea that, you know, sometimes we have different layers of our human design and um, even like during sleep. And um, so I'm like, part of me kind of really relates to a projector. And I think projectors show up for me as well as maybe some generators to remind us that we um of this waiting because because that's very in common with all types but projectors need to wait generators need to wait and rest because i think generators are so overworked and over busy so resting like that is a crucial need for projectors they show up i think to kind of remind us like Hey, we're we're all in this kind of together as well, even though we have different strategies, different energy. But getting back to the 21, what's interesting is when you were saying that, I felt like you're actually showing up for us because those of us who have the undefined will with the 21 activated, something I heard recently, and I'm still learning, I always say, even after seven years, you still learn layer after layer, lots of different things. Mm-hmm. There's so many weeds in human design. So there's it's never ending what you learn. But I heard recently that when you're an undefined center with a hanging gate, that you feel it more when somebody comes into your presence who has the definition of that center. Mm -hmm. So maybe you're showing up to all the people who have the hanging 21 to kind of reflect and amplify because of your defined will, because that's, that is rare. So it's not necessarily we're showing up for you. It's that you're, you're here to help, help us to really feel that 21. Yeah. But, or maybe it's both. Yeah. And you know, it's interesting because one of the things I'm doing is um, I'm doing a free class on this Wednesday. So if you're watching this in the future, just so people know that's October 18th, 2023, because this will be in the YouTube ethers for ever probably. Um, so, and it's a free class and I'll put a link in the details if anybody wants to still sign up for it, if you're seeing it in time. And it about the whole idea of how our centers being defined or undefined impacts us in relationship. And the thing that really inspired me was this consistent thing I keep seeing in conversation with people where they um, wind up 
like thinking one is better than the other because one is comfortable to them, right? So the people who have a defined will are annoyed by the amplification they feel from undefined wills. And they see it as something that the other person is doing to them instead of seeing it as something they're doing for them mm -hmm. and not that they're consciously doing, that their energy is doing. And so I think whenever we meet somebody who has the opposite definition in a center, we both bring an opportunity because when your center amplifies my defined will center, it's amplifying whatever I'm putting out. So it shows me where I still need to do the work, right? Yes. So when I don't like what you're putting back, it part of it is for me to say, oh, what am I putting out that she's amplifying, mm. right? Not, and not that I'm intentionally putting out, but what do I believe about my resources, about my worth, about, you know, the will center is all about self-worth and this trust and all of that lives in there. So what am I putting out that I'm not liking what I'm getting back? And if you're in a place of such having to prove yourself that what the way you're amplifying it is putting this over the top amount back, if I'm in a healthy place with my defined will, I'm going to be able to be like, oh, look at, she's still got this work to do that she's working on. She's trying, and it's not going to make me feel threatened or bothered, right? So whenever something bothers us, it's kind of a sign that we still have work to do, right? Yeah, and, and that's that's a great reminder. My husband has a defined will, so now I can take that in and right <laughs> understand and yeah, a and little bit be able better to, when I see that. Yeah, and the other way around is if you are somebody with a healthy, open will, you know, undefined or undefined means you have maybe one hanging gate, like Christy does. Open, we use that interchangeably, but technically open means no gates to find it all on there. So when you have a healthy, undefined or open will, and somebody has a still kind of toxic defined will, like strong, you know, ego, and you can feel that and not just let it go through you and not, not take any identification from it. You know, and it's not just, you know, oh, put because what we resist persists, right? So when we push back against the energy of somebody's healing that they need to do, like, oh, I'm not, don't dump your toxic stuff on me, which I get it. You know, sometimes we're not in a strong enough place yet, you know, but to make it be the other person's fault that they're not in a strong enough place either is not good for anybody. So I think that you know, it was nice to hear you say the whole like, oh, maybe I'm showing up for you, but you're showing up for me at the same time, because we're both here to see where we still have work to do, right? So that's the beauty of the defined center and the undefined, no matter what center it is. So, um, and I, at the beginning thought all the deconditioning was to be in my open centers and yeah, no, that's not necessarily true. I had lots of I think I, I have no gallbladder and the gallbladder lives in gate 51 of the um, will center. And I've had my gallbladder out because I burnt out my will center and it's, I have all the gates defined and 2644. So I was with an open sacral, just using my will to power through, to do everything that my mm -hmm. mind said I was supposed to do. So, and I didn't rest on the roof like you were supposed to. Yeah, I raised a manifestor cross of tension child instead. <laughs> While I was on the roof, right? So um, that's a little bit of work. So, yeah, yeah, sure. yeah. Okay. A lot of ins that's a great insight. Uh, my husband also has his gallbladder out and fifty. I don't know fifty one. I'll have to check his chart after this. Oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah. It'd be interesting to compare notes because I think you can definitely burn out your gallbladder even if you have an open will because it's it maybe even more so. Because if you're um, pushing, you know, really pushing uh, against things that are not necessarily in alignment with your strategy and authority. And that's where I love your self-care piece, because as we learn to really trust our body, our body has this innate wisdom to know what, um, what we need to do. Yeah to care for ourselves. Are you looking at your husband's chart now? Yeah. He's, he's <laughs> got a defined will and his only gate is the 51. Actually, it's the channel. He has the 51 
25. <clears throat> so it could be related to like the G center because he's um vessel of love. Oh yeah. So that's, um, yeah, yeah that's a uh, vessel of love. All the gates are on the G center for that one. So, and his 25 is his unconscious son. So it connects to the 51. So that's maybe where it burned out. <laughs> yeah. Right. Sure. So, um, it's really, it's really amazing when you start to do the connections between the things in our life. And also a lot of these things are things we bring in with us. And right now we're in this energy of this, you know, um, for those of you who follow astrology yesterday was the, uh, solar, the solar eclipse in Libra, which opened what's called the eclipse portal. We have another lunar eclipse then in two weeks on the full moon. And so really, really intense energy. And right now we're in this energy that's really calling us to look back and heal generations of mm -hmm. screwed up. And yeah. I don't know, I say hey, that, yeah, like there's all this toxic stuff where people just were trying to survive in past generations and developed really toxic traits that we're still carrying forward that aren't serving us anymore. And I really believe that that's, um, and there's a lot of people who are saying this, it's not my great wisdom. I've been hearing a lot um, that we're meant to be healing this right now. And so human design teaches us that where we have open centers is where our greatest um learning opportunities and wisdom fields come and you have three completely open centers three mm -hmm. which that means no hanging gates on them right that head and ajna it's like you don't even have anything pointing up towards them from there so that means you have a completely open vessel that is very um like Anywhere we have a receptor, gates. yeah. Anywhere we <laughs> like have a magnet pointing to it, we're more, we're more conditioned in those opposite ones. So it's completely like the whole full spectrum there. So I feel like that's really um, rare. I don't know that I've ever met anybody that has that mm -hmm. much. Your throat gates that you have are pointing down, and they're all also unconscious too. So. Um, what's that feel like to you? Like, can you talk about how, how that? Um, well, starting with the throat, I always laughed because one of the very first things I always remember when I did um, the first time I had a reading, I mentioned with Karen Flaherty, she mentioned, she's like, yeah, do you ever walk into a room and you say something and it's like, no one hears you. And I realized like, oh yeah, that's so, so true that even to this day, if I'm in a group and, you know, we're, we're having a good time and you kind of want to say something funny that like, cause you're thinking, oh, this, this would be really funny. And I say it and no one hears it. <laughs> it's really funny because like I, my husband who's defined throw again, using that as an example, you know, we'll be there together and he's telling jokes left and right. And people are like listening to find throw with the open head and option though. What's interesting is that I think these days. I'm very curious how people see things. We, there is a lot of going on, not just with the eclipse, but you know, we see in the news, we see um, in the circles. You know, we talk about. I would say, uh, you know, what's happening in a from a healing point of view. I'm always curious what other people think and their perception of it. But I'm also really mindful of not picking one thing to think that's the truth. I always see what resonates. I think that's something I've learned in the head and Ajna is like what keeps showing up for me and also what feels right right now. And I'm very, um, I'm almost, I'm really grateful that I don't have, that I'm, they call open-minded, you know, in a way that I can take it in and explore things and I think Karen Curry Parker once answered a question I had where both my husband and I have the undefined head in Ajna and his two centers only have one hanging gate. 
So he's completely also open in the Ajna. And she said something about how we like to explore things like that. We like to explore like thoughts and ideas, but we also like to explore feelings because that's where the open solar plexus is. And my husband is also completely open in his solar plexus. So the wow, two of that's us are rare. Usually talking about thoughts and ideas or feelings, like our, our deep conversations are about that. Like we're, we're kind of like trying to sample it. That's what, that's what uh, Karen said. Yeah. So in the, um, when we're, when we're looking at centers and relationships, you know, wherever we stay open, when we combine the charts, and I'm explaining this for people who are watching, watching, I'm sure you understand this, but when you have two centers and they combine it, there can be what are called electromagnetic connections where two hanging gates hook up and create a channel. So you get definition in the relationship, or you can have one person with a defined center and the other person without, and that relationship will feel defined. And so for there to be about 50 with the solar plexus, about 50% of the population has the defined solar plexus and around 50%. It's like slightly different than that, but very close. Um, and so it's very rare to have a relationship that between those great odds of the odds are 50, 50, that one of you is going to have it right. And one's not, um, but then you also add in the layer of hanging gates can connect. So it's pretty rare to find relationships where the solar plexus stays undefined. Um, so that means you're not going to hit, you're going to explore feelings together, but you're not going to have an emotional theme to your relationship, really. The, the emotions that you guys experience together are usually for coming from a place outside of the relationship most of the time. So. For sure. Or right? from conditioning, right? They're coming from a conditioned state of something experienced in the past that just is continuing to surface. So I do think you you're remember, right. Do you remember what gate he has in the head Ajna? In the head Ajna. So again, in the three, three, nothing, nothing is activated except for the 61. So, okay. So the 61. And so you're going to feel that and amplify that. And 61 is where um, the questions that are related to um, a lot of the more spiritual and um, even like they say, like one of the things it talks about is occult learning and just the questions about um, things like human design and astrology all kind of tend to be in that gate. So um, many times we will in our relationships amplify the definition even in just the hanging gates so um yeah so you're hmm so that seems to make some sense there too right it's interesting how that all works it's so, definitely interesting yeah yeah so how have you been feeling this chiron return i um what are your chiron gates again i have the wrong chart up i don't have your chiron on the conscious is 51 and unconscious is 42 so 51 and i know we talked about this um offline you know we were talking about 51 which is um the gate of shock right <laughs> yeah it's where my gallbladder died yeah <laughs> right and obviously i don't have that in my chart but that's a chiron gate so it's going to be activated for the Chiron return, I believe, right? Well, it's strong initiating energy that can often be very shocking. And it's often, um, so it often comes through a shock. Something shocking happens that is a catalyst for growth because it points to the G center from the will center. So um I'm wondering if there is something that you felt in the last couple of years that fits that description of a, a an experience that has caused you to shift towards this. Um, gate 25 is all about trusting in your spirit. It's a higher, it's a probably the most con deeply connected to source energy gate, right? Yeah. Um, maybe 55, but yeah. And I go back again, like 
maybe five years ago, I really was experiencing, um, that's when my father passed. Um, then like the following year, there was, um, a real, um, shift in my marriage. We even separated for a short bit. And then the third thing that happened in 2020 was this separation from the job that I had and that identity that it was a 20 year job I was in and 25 year career in marketing communications events. And then I went into this, which is so, so different. And so, um, the way that it happened was very shocking. Um, I walked into a, um, job review. We were, you know, annual reviews and it turned out that day, three of us, our jobs were getting eliminated. And this was just two months before the COVID started, the shutdown happened. So it was a real, to me, that was, uh, that feeling of shock that really kicked me into this whole phase of my life that I'm in. And I know that happened maybe a bit early, um, but I think I was around 47, Mm -hmm. turning 48, I think. Uh, Anyway, so it, like I said, maybe the timeline's not exact, but I felt like that was, it definitely felt like a shock. Yeah. Well, you know, um, none of this stuff is like a switch that happens at a certain time, but it's really all about, you know, Chiron return um, helps you to clean up what you have not healed already. It doesn't mean you can't already have healed the majority of it through experiences that you've had a little bit earlier. And so, um, and you're not done yet either. So not to be like... You know, and and not every shock is bad, right? Shocks can yeah. be, you know, oh my God, I won the lottery. That's a shock, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I also got some information from a friend talking about the the where my house is and my astrology, and I'm not really clear on all that, but uh, it's in Aries, I guess. So it's related to worthiness and money. And mm. certainly moving from a nine to five job into being entrepreneurial shifted the idea of how I made money or time for money and that value system that exists. And, you know, we're see. I keep hearing at least again, being attracted, I think into my radar of how so many people in 2020 left their jobs during COVID, but some, because they just didn't want to be at that job anymore. It was toxic and Um, I always say, like, when we see businesses closed, how many of those people were not happy with their business? And I know they didn't want it to close, but they closed and then maybe got to do something that they enjoyed more. So I was seeing a definition start to evolve around my self-worth and again, money. So it was in line with some of that, I think, wound that I needed to experience. Or maybe, um, maybe they weren't um, unhappy with their business, but maybe they were unbalanced in their life and they were so focused on their business and, you know, who knows, cause everybody's yeah. story is different. Yeah. So I'm not trying to in any way say that, you know, everything was good that happened during COVID, but exactly. everything, I, I believe everything is always working out for me and, and everything is always in some way for my good, even though it might feel horrible in the moment, you know, I mean, I've lost a lot of people in my life and I'm not saying that I would choose that again, but there's always something good in something unless you just choose to give up because of it. Right. Mm. So, yeah. 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 So interesting. Um, it's interesting that you're um, also your earth. I, Cause I love, there's a little feature on genetic matrix. And I just switched to my, your chart, looking at it with astro, um, quantum, there's a quantum astro interactive view where you can look at what houses stuff are in. So when you started saying that, I was like, Oh, let me look what she's got. And it's also your, um, the gate of resources, gate 21, the, the gate of the huntress. It's, it's, um, that one we were talking about on the will center, that's also in the house of money. So So that one really for you is about personal finances and money because that's where it's all at. Oh, yeah. Interesting. So tell us a little bit more about what you do now with your, because you have a private, you have a private group, like a Facebook group, and then you have a paid group as well, right? 
Yeah. So I, um, I have been a yoga teacher for many years and what I love is introducing people to like yoga and teaching them basic yoga, then they have the tools to go on and create their own practice. And so that's what I do for human design. I love to give people sort of an intro 101 of here's what human design is. I like to teach, speak on podcasts and also at events to give people this, maybe partly this gate of shock to introduce them to this tool and and I've seen a lot of people when they learn just the basic, it's like I said, a light bulb go, goes off. They're shocked into this new knowing about themselves. I give them something though in a basic way for them to understand. And I really help them support them with that strategy authority um, elements that really are the key pieces, I always say, of human design. I do have a membership group. So if people want continued support, um, and how do I use this tool? I do that as well. And I even have a, um, this year I've been working with somebody on a th three month program where women in small groups come to learn about human design and then do some clearing and energy shifting, which is really amazing to see in three months, what people start mm -hmm. to, with the, with the participants start to shift in their lives. So I like to provide that like network and support and container, um, and, and I like speaking, like I said, on human design, wherever I can. Cool. So you, um, you also have written, um, co or co-written or however you want to say co-authored, um, six different books. That's the one that you led, right. And then there are others that you are contributing. Yeah. Author to. Um, so, and I love this, this, I took the title of this book and your message there, if you want to just say it again, cause I know you showed it quick. Yeah. But I will. Yeah. And okay. this one is I produce with 25 other human design practitioners. It's called stop overworking and start overflowing 25 ways to transform your life using human design. So it's uh, a collaborative book. What I love is everyone wrote a chapter so you can read any chapter. It's their story as well as uh, tips or tools for how to use either human design or how to use self-care or energy to um, support you in being more of who you are. It's a great book. It's, it's very, um, story-like, um, and it's not technical. It's not one of these technical human design books. And that's what I love. I've been in five other, um, collaborative books. So I wrote a chapter in five others that talked about either the human design journey that I've been on or the self-care that I really promote. Um, and yeah, so that book actually today, I just posted on social media is like the two-year birthday of that book. Of oh, awesome. The design one. Yeah, that's really great. So um, so talk about this overflowing, overflowing part, stop overworking and start overflowing. We have, we've got about 12 minutes left, so I don't know how much you can um, yeah. get into it, but I love that. I love the idea. And yeah. um, I, I know there's a lot of people that... Um, are feeling a struggle right now because they're not wanting to continue this overworking, giving everything, you know, for, you know, selling their soul for a bigger house type of energy. But it's also scary to not keep up with that, right? So, yeah. So what, what inspired me to have this as the title was this idea that when you do discover human design, most of us are usually some more than others um, overworking where we're trying to initiate and even manifestors, they who have the strategy to initiate still need to wait. They need to wait for the right timing and to be rested. Um, so in a sense, if we're all, no matter what type we are overdoing things, and I think that's just how society has really um, been teaching us since an early age is um, what's your goal? How do you get there and start to follow those steps? And um, I listen to like Shark Tank. I, I really like that show. But one thing I don't like about it is how they're always saying you really need to be working to the bone. Like if you're not eating, sleeping, drinking your business. And I really feel like hmm, that's that's a traditional way that we're being taught. But what if there's a different way? What if there was a way we tune into what our energy strategy is 
and who we are. And then things start to align more naturally. And that's the overflowing part. So I just um, did do a recorded talk for this conference, uh, human design conference that really focused on how waiting is so important to that, to stop overworking. Um, one is being aware of how much we're conditioned to be working and doing. And the second is the importance of waiting. And Karen Curry Parker talked about how it's a healing time. The waiting is a great time for self-care, I say. It's a great time to explore who you are doing your inner work. It's a great time to even feng shui your office and 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 make it how you the environment that feels good to you and do to really doing things that light you up no matter what type you are helps your energy flow and so that overworking piece if we recognize it and then start to make some shifts the overflow starts to happen meaning it doesn't take that much time and effort um, it's more ease easy and effortless to be in flow if we recognize where we're overworking. Yeah, sure. Okay. That, that's, I I've been feeling that a lot right now. So many times it's so easy when you're starting a business to start to get in your head and be like, Oh, well, what should I be doing now? I should be doing something. I should be, um, I should be making something that says, you know, work with me, do that, you know, whatever I should be creating all these things. And I do know that it's important as a projector to be visible. And so, you know, I just was playing around last night and I made a reel and I was playing with different things with this one app or whatever. And then I, you know, put, so I just put this reel out about that class that I'm offering for Wednesday. And, um, it was fun to do it. So I did it, you know, kind of to play, but there's a time where in your head, you can be like, oh no, everything says I need to do it. This, this, this. And you know, every, every time you open up social media, you've got all these coach ads coming up saying, do this, do this, do this. You got to do this or, you know, all these things. And a lot of times what we need to do is just go take a nap. <laughs> right. You said a really important word. Cause I always pick up on what people are, how they're communicating. And that's my communication background, but you said a really important word, which is should. When that word pops up, it means we're doing things from the head and usually from a conditioned state. But if you're playing with reels because you're just having fun and then you suddenly get an invitation from that reel, wouldn't that be such a nice way to be growing your right? business? Yeah, I'm trying, I'm trying all these new things because it's good for your brain to keep learning new things, right? But I've really had to, you know, notice when I'm like, oh, isn't that interesting? I made this reel and it's got this many views and this reel that I did only had this many views. And then I try to think about what place was I at mentally when I made them. Yeah. And it's interesting. And some of it is what time was it when you released it because algorithms, and then there's so many things to think about. Right. But I don't really, um, the, the should, right? I, I catch myself often when I say words like should or the other word that I catch myself when I start to say I'm struggling with and I really, I still say it, but I catch it now and I shift it to the thing I'm still learning or the thing I'm actively working on. on yeah. And it feels more empowering and yes. less victim. So, but should and uh, should is something, and it's funny, my sister catches me on that too. No, you should, what do you mean you should, you know, or like, yeah. And, and with a defined will, I often speak from places of this like strong energy of, well, you need to da, 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 right. And then people are like, Oh yeah, there, that, that doesn't feel good. Right. But I've got my defined will energy coming with this because I'm pushing. Yeah. Right. I'm pushing. Yeah. The unhealthy defined will is when you're pushing the. Yeah. Stuff. So well, I also tune into words like when we say trying, or I want to, or I need to, because that's always showing that trying even is like the constant. You'll always be trying. Um, 
And I try, I try, I, my intention, that's what I usually use instead is my intention is, um, you also said something great. I want to point out, which is the idea of resting, Mm. which I haven't met a projector who didn't like resting, but, um, when you have, you've got a few motors and sometimes that might be, let's say not as easy to, to do, but I always encourage projectors to use rest as a way to actually grow your business because that's like part of your business plan. And if you're a generator, you really need self-care as part of your business plan or, um, you know, manifest or creative time as part of your plan, because that rest or downtime, whatever it looks like is going to help. Like you said, you show up with an energy. So you're real or whatever task you're doing in your job, um, or your business is from that place of like, feeling healthy and energized. Yeah. And, you know, I am a person who I often, you know, as a projector, undefined sacral, don't know when enough is enough. So I stay up late because I'm still in my head learning what, doing whatever, playing, and I get in some creative jaunt and don't go to sleep, right? And so, so much of my conditioning though is having to get rid of the, the shame. I, I'm that person who, you know, when when I would have um, a day where I didn't have to be up and I'm not setting alarm and someone would call me back in the days when we didn't have do not disturb because I now, just so you know, my phone is on do not disturb until 10 a.m. And I might be up at six and I might be up at 930. I don't know. But it's um, back then I used to answer my phone and then like lie when people said, oh, okay, <laughs> what did you see? Zoom is like, it does all I these did. It, so it does all these predictive things based on my, I always talk with my hands and it makes like, it's fun to watch what it'll do sometimes. So, um, but I would, I would lie and be like, oh no, I wasn't sleeping. I, I'm a little stuffy today or whatever it was for why I sounded the way, because there's this shame, you know, that we have like the early bird catches the worm, the, you know, all this early to bed, early to rise, all this stuff that we're taught. And so as a projector who needed this downtime, but wasn't somebody who liked to go to bed at eight o'clock at night, um, you know, and, and even that there was, there's, I think that, I think I had the judgment of that, like, oh, you're not cool if you go to bed at eight o'clock at night. So I've always been somebody who prided myself on the fact that I was up late, you know, it's, it was some sort of badge of honor. Badge of but, honor. Yeah. And so just getting rid of a lot of those ideas, that was one of the biggest things with human design for me was this relating to um, being able to just be who I am. And I noticed that um, we have a comment here from Murky Moo. And she says, I'd really love to know what people are doing beyond the awareness. Is it enough to know you're not self themes and catching oneself embodying open center themes? I don't think so. So she, okay. So did that make sense to you? You want to say something on that or? Cause I understand well, that's the awareness, but then what choices, I guess, are you making? What is, what's the difference and, and really, and this gets more into, I love what Karen's work is with the quantum. And also, um, I know some people dabble in gene keys, but like looking at both sides of the awareness of the, the light and the shadow or the shadow, not just as the negative, but as the, Oh, how does that serve me? And how do I, it, it's definitely, I always say 90% is awareness and then yes, make the choice differently. Yeah. And one of the things that I like to say is once you see yourself in the shadow, you know, which way to look for the sun, right? You know, which way to look for the light. So if you know, if you see the shadow, then the sun is behind you. So turn around. That's all you got to do. And so the shadow, just being aware of it is huge because you, and then the biggest thing is to not beat yourself up because that's when you start to really get stuck 
is when you go, oh, there's the shadow, there's the shadow. And you sit there and you look at the shadow instead of the saying, oh, there's the shadow. Turn around, look at the sun and being grateful for seeing the shadow, right? Oh, I'm, you know, I like when I start to feel that bitterness coming in as a projector and I can say, oh, there's the bitterness. Okay, this is a sign. I am not feeling recognized and invited. What invitation am I accepting that's not correct for me? What yeah. what invitations am I initiating instead of yeah. waiting for? And you can look for the things in a loving, gentle way. So, um, and she says, what does that look like in life, Kathy, turning to the sun? It means just gently noticing, oh, here it is. Like I'm like I'm kind, she says, got it. Okay. I think I explained it before she in before yeah. I said that she'd ask. So, but the biggest thing is just holding yourself gently in the process and being like with when we were talking about the centers, this is what I'm really talking about in this class that I'm doing on Wednesday night, is when you're feeling this emotional tension that you know comes up when you have an open solar plexus and someone is defined or vice versa noticing it and saying, oh, I'm really, I'm feeling this amplified energy right now, whether you're the person with the open center or the person who's getting it amplified back at you, I'm feeling this open and there's something icky feeling in it. Is it mine? And if it's yours, okay, thank you for showing me this. Is it not mine? Oh, okay. How can I support you as you deal with this energy or how can I just say, okay, it's not mine. It's not mine to deal with, but not resist it so much that we amplify it even more because then it becomes a big thing. So, and we are now 1202. I'm, I know I have been yeah. just talking and talking as always. Um, but I hope that I think Murky said that she got that in there. I'm going to add one last tip, which is sure. Um, in addition Please. to all that self-awareness, making a different choice, also doing self-care. Because when you're feeling like, oh, bumping up into your shadow or noticing, it is how do you then get into your body? It doesn't have to be related to that shadow, but going and just taking a walk, going and resting, laying horizontal. If your pr projector can be really just great self-care and generators and others um, going and doing some movement. It can be really right. Helpful. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Christy. And thanks to everybody who joined us either live or in the replays. Uh, Christy, can you let people know in, how it's the best way for people to get in touch with you if they want to contact sure. you? Um, I've got an active group on Facebook. Uh, anyone can join. It's Christy's Human Design and Self-Care Community. And my website is Christy H. Sullivan. So you can find my contact information there as well. Okay, great. And I'm, oops, and I'm assuming you'll put it in the context, in the contents, comments. I can't speak. For sure. Okay. So um, every week we share stories of how my guests have come to understand themselves in a more loving and empowering way through the lens of human design. How you think and speak about yourself matters. Human design can show you the reframe of not only your own story, but the story you tell yourself about your relationships. If you're ready to start living a better story, I'd love to help guide you. You can DM me or you can set up a free discovery call at kathybashanko.com. You can also get your free human design chart there if you don't have that already. So thanks to everybody and um, peace out. See you next week.